Yeah. Yeah, I can see the number of participants slowly have been let in 44. Okay, awesome. We can get started at this point, uh, guys. Good afternoon, everyone. I just see this meeting room slowly filling up. Welcome everyone to the Green Cells webinar. Just a few minutes, we're just letting everyone in and then we get started. Pankaj Sandesh, can, I, can we get started on the actual webinar now? Yes, I think so. Let's get going. In the FB link in the, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I do see our meeting room really filling out. It was excellent. Um, Thanks for taking time to join us this afternoon. Welcome to Green Cell's webinar on fall and winter gardening. Green Cell, as some of you know, and, uh, is a voluntary run nonprofit organization, passionate about raising awareness and consciousness of human created environmental issues. As part of our efforts, what we do is various community projects like cleanup drives, food rescues, donations, and uh, we also run a lot of campaigns, just in helping people get aware. Our objective is to help everyone to incorporate small and big changes in growing green in our everyday lives, which will go a long way in reducing the impact that we have, the negative impact we have on the environment and the natural resources of the world. Our aim is really to help everyone go green. Given this current COVID situation we're all in, We've been hosting a series of online webinars, which you all can attend safely from your home. These webinars are held typically on the second Sunday of every month. In today's webinar, Uma Shashikant uh, will talk to us on fall and winter gardening. Our following webinar is on November 15th, and that will be on hydroponics. Uh, Russell George will be the presenter for the hydroponics webinar and he will help us to learn how we can grow our vegetables without any soil. So do mark your calendar for November 15, 3 p.m. Eastern time, if you want to and join us on this journey of learning how to do hydroponic gardening. Today, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker, Umar Shishikant. To those who have joined us in our previous uh, prior webinars, Umar is no stranger to us. She's an urban gardener, who helps people convert their lawns and backyards into food gardens. She helps anyone set up a no-dig organic garden using homemade com compost. She's otherwise, apart from this gardening um, saga that she's involved in, she's engaged in teaching and writing about the financial markets for her profession. She's a storehouse of knowledge for composting and growing a healthy, high yielding garden and is always willing to share her knowledge and handhold us through this process of learning. We are having this uh, session from Atlanta, Georgia. I say this because we have participants across uh, America this time 
And it's interesting because now that it's a webinar, we're able to have participants across uh, the country. Um, unlike the workshops that we had that was limiting the audience to just Atlanta. Before we start a few housekeeping rules, we will have all the attendees on mute during the talk so that we can hear the speaker Uma clearly. If you have any questions during this talk or any thoughts to share during the presentation, please use the Zoom chat window to send us a message. If you are watching us live on Facebook or on YouTube, where we are present, you can ask us questions on whichever platform you're joining us on. Our volunteers are monitoring these uh, chat windows on Facebook as well as on YouTube. We'll get your questions to Uma so she can answer them and appreciate if you can mention your name and your city. That'll help us in uh, kind of getting your answers more specific as much as possible. We will try to answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. And if any questions are left unanswered, do email us at greencell.atl at gmail.com and we will definitely get an answer for you. Once again, I welcome Uma and Uma, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Geeta. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a joy to see that there is so much of interest in fall and winter gardening and um, uh, there are so many who have taken the time on a Sunday to join us uh, at this session today. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, before I get to the slides, I'll just provide a conceptual introduction to uh, winter gardening, and then we can kind of go into uh, the presentation itself. Fall and winter gardening is a nice way to keep your garden alive through the year. There is no need to really leave the garden fallow because there are seasonal vegetables that will take the cold, that actually thrive in the cold, and uh, more importantly, they produce sugars that the body needs during the time of uh, the year. So seasonality, just like how summer vegetables like cucumbers and melons are filled with water, winter vegetables like cabbages and cauliflowers and broccoli are filled with sugar. And what you will notice is that as the weather becomes colder, these become so tasty. The carrots that you harvest in the winter are markedly sweeter and crunchier than the carrots that you will uh, try and get in uh, summer. So fall and winter gardening is a way to extend your uh, gardening effort into um, the, the colder season. But this does not mean many come in and ask whether this will involve going out in the snow and actually gardening. That's the most beautiful part about fall and winter gardening. Everything is front-ended. All your effort has to happen now. So soon after the seminar, I would expect you to just go out there, buy your plants, buy your seeds, put them all in uh, well in time before the frost hits so that you have finished the task and then only harvesting remains. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is to uh, share the presentation that I have made for uh, today's talk. And we will take um, a break. It's an hour's uh, conversation we are going to have. We will take a break in between and try and answer the questions that come in. Geeta will moderate that. So let me go ahead and share the uh, presentation that I have made. All right. Geeta, presentation showing up quite all right? OK. Um, it's so it's showing up nice and clear. All right, so um, we did say that this presentation is coming to you from Green Cell and uh, at Green Cell, we are passionate about uh, raising consciousness about human created environmental issues and running a sustainable garden is one of the ways to kind of provide your family chemical free food while at the same time practice sustainable living. Uh, we hope more and more people can come uh, into having a food garden in their backyards. So these are the four sections. We have some concepts first, and then I have a planting list. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a brag. I'm going to show you uh, pictures of produce from my garden to illustrate this. Um, getting started, um, the steps, and then a few maintenance. There is, there is just two slides there, few points about maintenance. Uh, now to the concepts. I always like to start with the concepts. People who have attended my session know that I like to kind of 
provide the principles and theory first and then go into the specifics. Um, science has now established that there is a nice fungal network that is present below the soil. Research has increasingly shown how there is life below in the soil and how this is alive all the time. And these fungi and the various microorganisms that are present in the soil are an important uh, functional uh, uh, functionary in ensuring that our food is incorporated with the right nutrition, the right minerals, the, the um, uh, even the um, benefits of photosynthesis, how they are, they are spread across plants, all of that is managed by this web that runs in the soil. And this web is fed by the roots of plants. So plants actually are standing there and doing a barter. They are from the sun creating through photosynthesis sugars. And down below in the ground, they are exchanging the sugars that they produce with the various organisms for the various things that they need. So if you want a good soil, if you like your garden to be um, well-balanced, pest free, because this process of active exchange of nutrition also creates a lot of organisms that will kill pest eggs, that will clean up the soil, that will rid the soil of parasites. So if you kept your soil alive, in a sense that alive active root is a critical ingredient in keeping your garden soil, soil alive. So try not to leave your soil fallow. Do not close your garden in the month of October and then say, I'm going to come back in May and this is just going to lie as it is. You will find that your soil has become hard. You will find that your soil um, requires additives in spring. Whereas if you grow a winter garden, you will find that your soil is fantastic and beautiful and absolutely ready for you in spring. So keep soil alive. And growing to season, as I mentioned earlier, there are there is food that will thrive in the winter. For example, peas are not going to fruit at temperatures above 60. Spinach is not going to germinate at temperatures above 70. So there are vegetables that taste sweet, crunchy, and nutritious. And there are vegetables that will only grow and thrive. You'll find a Swiss chard completely eaten up by bugs in the summer, but beautiful, glossy, colorful, and crunchy in the winter. So growing to season, eating to season is now established as a very good way to stay healthy so having a winter garden gives your family food that grows for that season right at your yard. When we say winter garden, many are worried about the frost and the snow. Unfortunately, a lot of garden conversation is about first frost, frost and last frost, first frost and last frost, that everybody believes that gardening activity should begin after the last frost and should end on the first frost, not required. What happens is, the, the way to look at it is to, uh, there's just one little bit of uh, science that you need to understand here, which is um, different plants require different climatic conditions to grow and thrive. However, seeds will not germinate at cold temperatures. That's the only reason we track frost. Okay. So if you sowed your seeds in the middle of winter, they are not going to be able to germinate. There is hardly any seed except for peas. Peas will germinate at about 40. But except for peas, there is pretty much nothing that will germinate in the cold. So the principle is you sow them. In fact, many of us begin sowing the seeds in August, you know, so that you keep the plants ready. And uh, those of you who are coming in now, since you can just go to the stores and get these seedlings, which have been started in August for you. So you can get those trays and put them in. But so the idea is you grow the plants before winter or you let the seeds germinate when temperatures are good. And then you put them into the soil. Let's say you're going to do it now. Now your window actually gets closed by the end of October when temperatures would have started falling. Depending on your zone, temperature, soil temperatures, if you notice the soil temperatures, when you find that your day temperatures are dropping below 60, then very unlikely you will have any seeds germinating. So what we do is we get the seeds to germinate by the end of summer. We get them to grow when temperatures are good, which is in the month of fall. We put them into the ground and we make them all ready, standing out there in the garden before the frost hits. That's what we do. But what these plants will do is we call this as overwintering. What happens is, now let's say you put in a chart 
you put in a cabbage, you put in a cauliflower, you put in broccoli. Now, all of these are tiny little plants when you put them in the month of October. By November, let's say frost hits. I'm talking about Atlanta, but if you're talking about other zones, then you might have to advance your planting schedules um, according to your uh, frost dates. So ideally, you want the plant to be about four to six weeks in the soil, developing, having the time to develop its roots before the temperatures drop. These plants will just sit there during the winter. Many of them will produce during winter, but they will go through a phase when they will be quiet. I'll talk about that. But by 15th of January, they will take off. Now, the temperatures are perfect for these crops from around 15th of January, going all the way until end of May. So your produce will come in there. So when we talk of winter crops, we're actually talking of putting crops in in November so that we can start harvesting from January. A few crops like spinach and uh, radish and others will give you an yield before the frost itself. Depending on how soon your soil gets cold, you can get an early harvest. But uh, imagine harvesting a cabbage. You cannot put the cabbage in the soil in January because the soil is going to be cold. You can't get, you can't get the crop. So if you put it in March or April when it is germinating, by then it has become so hot, the plant will be completely ridden by bugs and beetles and not give you a yield. So the best way to grow a cabbage is to overwinter it. So the idea of overwintering is at the crux of winter and fall gardening, where you will start the plants in uh, the month of October, you will overwinter them and they will start yielding from January onwards. I'll give you a list and I will show you plants that will produce for you all the way from October onwards, okay? Now, there are at least about 50 different things that you can grow in the fall and winter. I'll provide you with a partial list, uh, but if you looked at growing temperatures for plants and if these temperatures are cool temperature plants, they will all come in. So you'll be able to have a diverse set of crops in your kitchen and in your garden, okay? There's a question, people, winter gardening brings up sites of having to wade through the snow to go and uh, water the plants. No, sir, there is no watering in winter garden. You don't have to water the plants at all. There is, there is enough dew. You put the plants in and that's that. There is no pruning, there is no composting, there is no manure, there is no pest control because no pests survive. That's the joy of winter gardening. There is low maintenance. You only step into the garden to take your harvests. And I think the joy of the harvest is adequate for you to kind of layer up and go there and bring those cabbages and broccoli and cauliflower in. Yeah. So you get a continuous harvest. And because of the sugars deposited in the winter, exceptionally tasting lettuce and kale. Those who complain that kale is not um, good to eat haven't eaten overwintered kale. You eat kale that is growing through the winter, you will find that the taste is absolutely beautiful. The same is true for collards, the same is true for arugula, and the same is true for several vegetables that you find to be bitter because you are growing and eating them when the temperatures have gone up, which is not their season. So that's end of section one. So you, it's important for you to remember that you're not going to be working out in the cold. A lot of people say, no, I don't do winter gardening because I, I cannot go out in the cold. You don't have to go out in the cold, all right? I'm going to take a minute to talk to you about Persephone. Uh, by the time you have sown your vegetables, let's say you've sown them all, sown your seeds, put your transplant now in October. November is iffy, you know, though so we know that the frost will set in sometime in November. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it's, you know, temperatures are good till Thanksgiving and so on and so forth. So the, the date that we want to worry about, it's not the first fro frost or the last frost, but in gardening, the day we want to worry about is what we call as uh, Persephone. Persephone is the month when the, uh, the time when the daylight hours are less than 10 hours. Typically that starts around the 9th or 10th of December in Atlanta and it is over by uh, 9th of January. That's for Atlanta. But you can look at your um, uh, time zone and look at what is Persephone. But what happens during Persephone? When plants re realize that this window of sunlight is not even 10 hours, they just stop. Nothing happens. No growth. So you, why is this important? Your plants must be in the ground, established, rooted, 
and maybe about six to 10 inches tall by the time Persepone hits your zone. Because after that, for one whole month, they have to just be standing. And when I say respect Persepone, you don't touch the soil during Persepone. You don't dig, you don't sow, you don't harvest, you do nothing. You just let plants be. So that one month is lost in winter garden, in a sense. It's a month in which nothing happens. And anyway, we are all busy with Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and holidays and all of that. So it's, it's fine. So that, but what's important is January 10th, when Persepon ends, you will find that your entire garden will come to life. Your plants will grow so rapidly. Your roses will break out. You'll find those pink tips, right time to prune those roses. Your Swiss chard will come alive. Spinach will set out new roots. Your broccoli is fruiting. Your cabbage is beginning to form. So it's beautiful time by around 15th of January, 10th of January onwards, your winter garden will start yielding from the 10th of January. You can start taking harvest. Now, for you to harvest from 10th of January, you have to sow now. Because you cannot sow in December, the soil is cold. You cannot sow by end November because the soil is already cold. You cannot sow early February because there's still frost. You have to sow now in October, put that garden up, set it up, spend the time. It should take you about half a day to sow about 300 plants in your backyard. That's it. So take that half day, sow the seeds, put the transplants, set your winter garden up, and then that's it. Once you have put them all in and watered them, once you have, they established, then you just wait for the harvest. I'll just talk to you about those plants in a bit, but that's what is the gist of winter gardening. However, there is one task you have to be careful about. The juicy carrots and radishes and all of these, rabbits love them. They just come in and have a good harvest. So if you have rabbits coming into your garden, you must protect them, fence, protect your crops. And also remember that animals like deer will run out of food because all the plants have shedded. So deers will definitely browse your garden. Uh, when they find nothing else to eat, a patch of green will attract them. So please keep your garden protected from. While you won't have insect pests, the four-legged uh, creatures will definitely be looking for food. So you will need protection from them. So fence your garden. The only way to protect from them is to fence and uh, cover up your garden. So that's like end of part one. Um, Gita, I'll just go to the planting list directly because we were just only talking concepts. We'll take questions at the end of the planting list. Okay? Sounds good. I mean, if there's anything relevant to your talking, I'll let you know, you know, so that you okay. can just touch on it. So I'm just going to quickly run you through what you can grow and show you a list. Now, this is overwintered spinach. As I told you, spinach will germinate only at 65. Extremely fussy plant. 65, maximum 70. So you find a window when temperatures are around 65. Please go ahead and sow spinach. Spinach can be harvested. You can harvest the side leaves and the center leaves will continue to form. There are overwintering spinaches which will take temperatures up to 20 degree Fahrenheit. So you can go and buy a Manstroyox, for example, which will take up to 15 to 20 degrees of temperature. Uh, they will be those, my Indian friends who are planning to, who are bringing seeds from India, please remember that at 40, those, at 50, those spinaches will start wilting. They can't take temperatures below 50 because they are desi. Right? So if you buy seeds which are from here, seeds which are um, uh, from plants here, cover, for example, is a slow bolting for spinach. It will not go to seed even in the month of April. So you sow now. So you put in the spinach seeds now, put them in a row. They'll come up. You keep harvesting. You start harvesting from end November. You can harvest until end April. Same set of plants. Absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, plant to grow and takes the cold very well and tastes fantastic uh, during the cold. There are at least half a dozen, dozen spinach varieties that are available. Again, for my Indian friends, there are many who um, mistake amaranthus for spinach. No, they're two different things. Amaranthus is a summer green. Please, spinach is not the common name for green things. Okay, so don't call everything spinach. Spinach is spinach, as you see in this picture and you buy seeds which are marked as spinach and um, um, uh, you can grow them and they'll beautifully overwinter. They're very easy to, they will stay through the cold and they'll do very well. 
just sprinkle the seeds, uh, poke them in with your, with your hand and look for temperatures, right? Then the whole set of Asian greens, this is the red tat soy, the red tat soy, uh, the whole set of uh, uh, Chinese and Korean greens, bok choy, all of them will overwinter well. They will all take the cold temperature, sow the seeds now. Most of those seeds look like mustard seeds, simply sprinkle them thickly. They will germinate in about four days time and uh, they will grow well and they will bolt when temperatures go beyond 65. Um, keep harvesting from the side and you'll have a constant supply of leaves. That's overwintered cabbage. Cabbage is one of the most beautiful things that you can grow in the winter. If you have not started the plants, don't worry. They are available as transplants in most stores. Home Depot, Tractor Supply Company, Lowe's and everybody else, Pike, everybody has Cabbage, cauliflower, cabbage, you again have at least four or five varieties that I grow in my garden. You have this, which is your uh, the typical green. You have uh, uh, the curly cabbage, you have the Napa cabbage, you have the purple cabbage. So you can uh, get a choice of cabbage, which is available in your garden. They will grow and form, they will begin to form heads in January. You can start harvesting them from end January and you will have a crop all the way until end April. As the heat becomes higher, they might uh, begin to uh, get insects. So one of the things that you want to do is to sow dill, cilantro, and such herbs closer to your cabbage so that even when in spring, when the insects start coming, they do not affect your cabbage crops. But typically cabbage grown in winter will have absolutely no pests. Uh, so that's overwintered cabbage. Uh, radishes are the most easy crop to grow. You get at least Right here in the US, you get at least six to seven types of radishes that you can grow in your garden. You have the white icicle, what you see here at French breakfast. You have the right, round globe, you have the red rose, which is a pure red cabbage, uh, uh, radish. You also have the Asian uh, long um, uh, radishes. The simple round globe radish, or even the English, the French breakfast, which you're seeing here, they all form in about 35 days. So these are simplest crop to grow. So you get the seeds, sow them at a distance. Each radish needs about an inch of space for itself. Remember that radish will not form if you sow them too closely. If you've sown them very closely, please trim them off. Use the leaves for uh, salads and chutneys and parathas and dals and everything else that you, you can pretty much, they, they taste. Winter greens taste absolutely crisp and sweet. They are not bitter. So you'll be surprised how uh, tasty, freshly grown radish is. In about 35 days, radishes will form and you can keep harvesting them. So you can also sow radishes in batches. So you start sowing one, one row now and in a week you sow again. You can sow them all the way till frost. And once Persipone breaks by about 15th of January, you can start sowing again. So you can have a continuous crop of uh, radish. Very easy to grow, no pests. And what is more important is the soil in which radish has grown is beautiful for growing all your cucumbers the next season. So wherever you're planning to grow cucumber next year, please make sure you've grown radish in the winter. You will get protection from a lot of pests that typically attack uh, cucumber plants. Um, there are so many varieties, as I said, there is white and, um, uh, you know, these seeds are easily available from most uh, uh, sellers of seeds. I told you about Asian greens, bok choy is again another, um, uh, Asian green, which is very easy to grow. You can just get the, uh, just put in the, uh, the base of the store-bought bok choy. It will just simply settle down, root, and start providing leaves. So you can even grow them from the stumps of what you buy from stores. It's a fairly easy vegetable to grow. The only condition for bok choy is that it needs temperatures at 60. So it is a winter vegetable. It won't take root if it's very warm. So it will beautifully grow in the fall. Just one question, this dill and cilantro and you know, mm. the verbs you're talking, which you can directly sow as seeds, like even radish. That's right. That's right. right now as seeds, is it? Yes. You're still yes. in that window where seeds yes. will. Yes. Cilantro and will come beautifully in winter, dill will come. So they'll all, they'll all see. That's what I said earlier. You're mm. right now in that phase where the day temperatures, particularly in Atlanta, are in 70. Next week, we even have an 80. Okay. So your night temperatures are in the 50s. So right. it's an ideal temperature for most seeds to germinate. In this window, pretty much anything you put in the soil will germinate. 
So put right. that in. As the temperatures drop, bees won't germinate. So okay. make this list and put the seeds in. That's why I said front end. All your effort is now. Between today and end of October, you should have put everything in. 31st October is full moon. Do you mind? Mm. That's your curtains drawn. Beyond that, temperatures will drop to 40. You pretty much cannot sow or germinate anything. So between the, in the next two, th two to three weeks, please put all your seeds in, put all mm. your transplants in and set the garden up uh, so that you give the plants a chance to germinate. After that, your germination rates can fall depending on how cold the soil is. Now, the exception is our Indian methi or uh, fenugreek. For those of you who worry, I am not going to the shop, I don't have seeds and all of that, just pick up the bottle of methi seeds from your kitchen, walk out to your garden and sprinkle very, very closely. Methi will germinate even in the middle of winter. You can continue to sow methi in November, end November, uh, mid-January, okay? So temperatures of 25 and all methi has germinated and stayed. It's an amazing Indian plant that seems to like cold. So it just lives through the frost. Yeah. But the one limitation for methi is that it, you can't pinch, it won't pinch and come back. So oh. it's a single harvest plant. So once you've sown it, you will have to take a harvest, which means you pull out the entire plant. Okay. It's also an excellent nitrogen fixer. So please, uh, if you wonder that you have space and you don't know what to sow, please sow methi. Easy. It'll germinate in two days. It takes just two days. Just take a bunch of seeds. There's no need to people say, oh, I have to soak. I have to sow. I have to cover. You do nothing. Just take a bunch of seeds in your hand and just go out there and sprinkle and pour, pour some water. Water it thoroughly so that, see, it's important for seeds to remain moist until they germinate. That rule is true for most seeds because germination begins with the swelling of the seed with moisture. Okay? So if the seed becomes dry, it cannot germinate. Okay. So you either sow the, the, throw in the seeds just before a rain or you put in the seeds and water them thoroughly so that they're able to take the water in and uh, get soaked. We cover the seeds so that the moisture is protected. The reason we poke the seed in or cover the seed is to make sure that the wind doesn't make them dry and the germination doesn't fail. So the seed must remain moist until it germinates. That's all we want to ensure. So just go out there, sprinkle methi closely water it thoroughly and leave it. Third day, it will start germinating. Seventh day, you can harvest. It's a simple plant to grow. The early microgreens can be harvested from day seven. The methi as a plant with full leaves, you can harvest from 25 days onwards. You can grow it in patches. So it's another winter crop. This is the, the winter's delight. The cilantro that you can harvest in winter are unbelievably flavorsome that once you start growing cilantro in the winter, um, it's very difficult to appreciate store-bought cilantro. And what you see on the right is cilantro that was harvested just after a frost. What happens is after a frost, when you go and look at your cilantro plants, all the oil is, essential oils have all come on the leaves. So the leaves are all as if they are coated in oil, you know, and they're all shiny. So put in the seeds now. Please do not put store-bought cilantro seeds. They will be old. They will be treated and in some cases they will also be infected by insects which would have eaten their insects. So do not cringe on quality of seeds. Buy the seeds, okay? I saw um, uh, a, a seed variety called Leisure from Johnny Spe uh, um, Select Seeds, mm -hmm. but that's not the only one. Any of the store-bought uh, cilantro packets will have viable seeds. Check out with friends who can spare them for you. Um, some of my friends uh, tell me that, oh, but I plant only the organic cilantro seeds. Um, so I'm not too sure how well many of them germinate and do. All right. So uh, please share seeds with friends and buy them and sow them. Do not cringe on uh, buying seeds. And then you can have a patch cilantro. You can keep pinching. It will keep coming back. Yeah. And it grows all through. And the beautiful thing about cilantro is by about March, it will start bolting, which means it will start flowering. And it immediately becomes a wonderful attractor of beneficial parasites, um, parasitoid wasps into your garden. These wasps will control all those worm populations, which will come in and uh, eat up all your spring plants. So your best 
bet for pest control in your garden is to have cilantro. If you have cilantro, it will flower and those beautiful white dainty flowers will come at the time when new pests are coming into your garden and they will bring an army of um, uh, predators which will keep all your pests in control. So uh, please have cilantro all around your garden to offer you pest control. Allow these plants to flower and it will beautifully go to seed. Please collect those seeds and then you don't have to buy seeds from the second year onwards. Yeah, you can use those seeds and uh, they will come back. You keep clipping them, they'll keep coming back. They're very prolific. Enjoy your cilantro and share with friends. Very easy to grow in the winter. They take the cold very well. They can survive at temperatures of up to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Swiss chard, it's very tiny when uh, you put it now. Swiss chard also looks ornamental. Um, some of us have had the courage to put them in the front yard. They look beautiful and colorful and uh, they look tiny right now when you sow them. You can buy the seeds and sow the seeds. They come up. They will be tiny before the winter, but from January, they will take off. You can see the size of the leaf. I've just kept my hand to show you the size, relative size of the leaf. So they're huge. They look very pretty, very colorful, and very prolific, and absolutely crunchy and sweet to grow. Very easy to grow. And as I said earlier, you don't have to fertilize any of the winter vegetables. You don't have to apply anything. You don't have to spray anything. You don't have to apply anything because in the cold, there is no bacterial activity in the soil. So what you want to do is, uh, I will talk about it. You will cover your soil with a layer of compost now before you, before you sow. Before you sow the seeds, apply a nice layer of compost and sow your seeds and put your transplants. And that is that. You don't have to add anything else at all. In the month of March, you know, you might want to add some more compost to all the plants that are there. Um, I'll talk about them in a bit. So between October and March, you don't have to do any fertilizing for any of your fall or winter crops. So those are the overwintered broccoli. They were sown in August, transplanted in October. Uh, you can buy transplants from the shop and put them in now. And uh, those are uh, the heads that formed in uh, January. You can simply break them off and uh, eat them right there in the garden. They're absolutely sweet. And uh, once you've taken the main head off, there will be side shoots and the plant will send out another bunch of uh, broccoli for you to harvest all the way until the heat of the summer sets in. Um, that is cabbage when temperatures in Atlanta had dropped to about 21 on a particular day. What you see on that's actually completely frozen. Okay like brittle as ice, it's completely frozen cabbage. The plant will just recover, okay? It's only in those regions where you have consistent low temperatures for a longer period of time that you need fleece covers. You need protections, you need um, to have, uh, you know, I will show you, I will talk to you about fleece covers. In Atlanta, if you find that there is a, a long period, like let's say, uh, five to six days of very low temperatures in the 20s, your garden will need protection. But otherwise, your garden will be fine. If there's going to be one or two nights of uh, sub-30 temperatures, anything below 32, you will worry about. Some plants will not survive. I will tell you about those. But, um, for example, peas will die. Peas will not survive uh, frost. But, uh, which is one of the reasons why we sow peas uh, in January rather than now. Um, so, Potatoes, potatoes will not take the frost, but cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, they will all stand there in the frost. They will freeze like this and they will continue to grow beautifully. Yeah. So that's the cabbage from home cut. Not a single insect, not a single blemish and absolutely sweet. Yeah. Um, same thing with beetroots, the beetroot leaves as well as the beetroot both are edible and uh, taste very good. Carrots, carrots are a little speciality vegetable because I talked to you about Persipot, which is 9th of December. And uh, unfortunately for carrot, carrot is, many carrots are 70 day crops or slightly 65. Some crops will take even 80 days or more to form. Now, what happens is your carrot has to be fully formed before Persipot. Only then it will stay. 
Now let's assume you put your seeds now. I won't advise you to put it now, okay? I'll tell you why. Because if you put your seeds now, by December 9th, your carrot is only about 60 days old. So there will be a carrot that is formed, but that carrot will be tiny, okay? It is still 15 days short. It won't grow out of Persephone. It will remain that. You can harvest it anytime. You will only get those little tiny carrots. So you must sow carrots in August or September to be able to get a early January crop. Considering that that window has gone, you should sow the seeds sometime in February. Around mid-February, sow the carrot seeds. Ensure that they are well spaced. The plants need to be well, well spaced. If there's no spacing, you will get no carrots. You will only get leaves. Make sure that each plant has about two inches of space for itself. And um, you can harvest them uh, by end May. They're not going to be as sweet as the overwintered carrots, but still worth uh, trying. So you can grow carrots in the spring. Uh, but right now, as we're talking, it is late to sow carrots. Carrot greens are pretty much useless. I've tried various things. There are people who, have, who still are very valiant about cooking carrot greens. I don't belong in that club. Um, lettuce. Lettuce so will grow. Carrots, what carrots that we uh, were sold in August, when do we harvest them? You can harvest them anytime in winter. They're ready. Hmm. About 80 days, the carrot, you'll see the tip of the carrots showing. Mm -hmm. It's like your uh, refrigerator in the ground. So whenever you want, you go out, harvest your carrots and bring them in. All through winter, they're available. If you sow in August, mm -hmm. you can harvest them all through end March. Okay. March okay. and April, you can harvest them. Once you've finished, once they have set before Persepon, mm -hmm. then um, you can harvest them all the way till even end April. We've harvested even end April. They will stay absolutely sweet, moist in the ground and beautiful. Uh, lettuce is very easy to grow right now. They love to germinate in these kind of temperatures. Um, please sow them. You can sow them in trays and then transplant them if you want. Or you can sow them directly and thin them out. But um, all kind of lettuce will grow very beautifully in the winter. Many of them are winter hardy. Many of them will take very low temperatures. Many arugulas will survive. Many of the mustard varieties will survive through um, winter. But sow the seeds now. Make sure that these plants have grown. And by Persipon, by December 9th, you want these plants to have at least four to five leaves. Because you want the plant to have established. By the time it comes to a standstill, you want the plant to have established well. And then, you know, you can keep harvesting the side leaves. If you sow now, there are many lettuce plants that are only 25 day crops. So if you sow now, you will start harvesting by early November. Yeah, So they are very easy crops to grow. The same is true for... Um, what happened to the presentation? One second. Yeah. So this is the list. Okay. So you can sow fava beans. I mean, if I were to talk about each one of these... So you, you can, can ask everyone to take a picture of this slide so that it will, you know... There have been several questions on what can be sowed directly and what yeah. should be transplanted. So it's a good sow, time. You can sow cilantro, coriander. As I said, beets you can still sow now. Carrots, it's a little late to sow now. Sow them in the end of January. Sow Asian greens, spinach, chard, mustard, lettuce, collards, kale, leeks, arugula, onion, garlic. Onion, garlic do beautifully overwintered. Get the garlic bulbs separate the pods and put them in and forget about it. That's it. You put them now in October, by July, each pod will become a bulb of garlic and you can harvest them. Get the onion sets and put them in now. By July, you'll have absolutely beautiful, large onions coming in your uh, garden. So turnip, radish, fava beans dust. You can sow fava beans in January as well. But um, the problem is overwintered fava is sweeter than fava that is sown in um, late winter. Okay, so if you if you can um, put in the plants now, and they're very very prolific. About four to five plants are adequate for a family. They will start yielding only in June, but they're very prolific. Um, plants like so all of these are direct sow, a uh, nulkol, 
um, uh, called kohlrabi as we call it, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprout, celery, all of these are plants that have to be started, grown and transplanted. Many of us started these in the months of uh, August and early September, and we have transplanted them. But those of you who are coming in now and beginning your fall, fall and winter garden now, you can buy these transplant from the store. They're all available at stores. And in any of the stores where the pansies and the mums are in the front, somewhere at the back will be these trays lying and languishing. Please pick them up. Um, many of them sell for about $3 for a six plant tray, fairly reasonably priced and uh, bring them and put them in and you will find that these plants are tiny but by january you will start getting harvest uh, after the persipon breaks around 15th of january you can start sowing carrots again you can start sowing beetroots again you can sow radishes again if you fail to sow spinach now you can show sow spinach and coriander or cilantro again but more importantly you should start your peas around that time peas are started around mid-february and peas take about 60 days to start yielding and they are frost sensitive. So two things about peas. One, squirrels will be absolutely hungry at the time looking for food. So they will eat up all your seeds. They will dig them all up and consume them. So you have to protect the peas from squirrels when you sow them in um, February. Two, they cannot take a frost. So um, look for varieties that can take a frost or uh, try and give them some protection with the frost cloth or uh, uh, something, you know, for those few days when it might be cold. Once you're protected from overnight uh, low temperatures, they tend to do well. So that is uh, uh, the list. As I said, this is also only a partial list. There are at least 50 to 60 different beautiful things that you can grow in your garden in the fall and winter. And all of those plants will thrive and love the cold and yield absolutely well. So that is the planting list. Geeta, are there questions at this time? There are, there are uh, several questions, but I think quite a few of the questions you've covered. So mm -hmm. there is, I'm just going to quickly run through some of the questions. Is there any sun requirements for the uh, garden, vegetable, you know, winter gardening? we should look out okay. for. So that, that's, a, that's a beautiful question. Now, the, the advantage is a lot of people who suffer because of shade in their backyard. Okay. Now, all the leaves have shed, trees have shed all their leaves. So there's absolutely no problem. It'll all grow. Don't plant your plants in absolute shade or below a very large tree. Okay. But um, the amount of sun available itself is less, right? Even now, we have less than 12 hours of sun. So all of winter, we have only a limited amount of sun. Most of the crops survive on light, not like direct sunlight, but on just hours of light. So make sure that they get light. Take advantage of the fact that all your large trees are all bare and enough light is passing through. So most of these crops should do anywhere, well, anywhere in your garden, as long as they are not in the shade of your house. The corner, the northeast corner of your house is completely shaded by your house itself. Okay. So nothing will grow there, okay. right? So make sure that you're not planting where the shade of your house is falling and don't plant where there is an evergreen. Like if there is a magnolia, which is an evergreen and it is shading the garden, obviously nothing will grow there, okay? Right. So, but most of these plants will grow in um, a good, good amount of light. So, yeah. And uh, there's one question slightly different, but um, if the person doesn't have a backyard, can they grow these vegetables in containers? Absolutely. They will all do beautifully. The only difference between growing in containers and growing in the ground is containers might require watering. Ah, okay. Uh, what you're growing in the ground requires absolutely no watering. It'll be it'll fine. It'll just the, it'll be fed by the dew, so you don't have to worry. Um, but um, if you're growing in containers, you might have to check for the water because the wind will dry out the soil in the container. You sow all your winter crops as closely as possible so they're able to huddle together, keep themselves warm, preserve the moisture and all of that. I will come to preserving the moisture in a bit. Yeah. Just one more. I'm just going to ask you one more. Is there any tips on, you know, the, when you talked of these vegetables in terms of quantity that we would need to grow, like for spinach, say, or carrots? Is there any okay. guidance? You have to grow to be able to figure one. 
Okay. So whoever right. asks me this question, I tell them just go out there and start growing. Yeah, you will think. <laughs> no, I've heard that answer. But, <laughs> that's what I would say. Uh, you know, uh, but um, uh, peas, for example, you need 20 plants per person. Right. In the family, you know, you need 20 plants. So, and you have to sow them really closely. Peas has to be sown very closely. Mm -hmm. um, so cabbages, for example, you know, you will want to have about, if you assume that you're going to cook uh, one cabbage every 10 days and you're going to start cooking from January, how many do you need? You need about 10 cabbages by which time the family is already protesting. Yeah, <laughs> you don't need more than that. But yes. half a dozen of each of these plants is enough. You know, focus on the variety than the quantity. Unfortunately, most garden forums are filled with pictures of people, you know, showing a fantastic harvest and the table is filled with some, you know, 100 brinjals. I, I don't understand these pictures. Because what will a family do with 100 brinjals? My heart goes out to those children. <laughs> a good garden table is one that has diversity. That's if you're able to harvest three different vegetables every day. Right and provide enough variety that you're not repeating what you're cooking uh, for your family, you're doing well. So focus on different varieties of plants, about mm -hmm. half a dozen each of each one of these should be uh, more than enough. Okay. Um, and uh, children will scream if you have more than four Brussels sprout plants. Remember that each plant can produce about 100 sprouts, okay? So you uh, cannot be a gardener and not be generous and willing to share. Let me tell you this. There is really no choice. Generosity is forced upon you when you're a gardener. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple of more questions on, um, a couple of questions on this frost cloth and the use yeah, of- Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. So let's continue with your talk. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in the next sessions, which is like, yeah. Okay, now that I've heard the list and I have heard the concepts, what do I do starting? Okay, you must prepare your bed. That's my garden bed. So you prepare your bed. When you prepare your bed, it means that you must add compost. There must be an inch of, in my garden, I will add an inch of compost, which I make at my backyard every October and every April. I will add an inch at least of compost. Sometimes an inch, sometimes two inches. So all my beds will receive compost that is cooked in my backyard. And if you, so if you're not able to make the compost in your backyard, please order it and uh, apply compost to your garden beds before you put the seeds or before you put transplants. Because remember that throughout the winter, you're not going to feed these plants. So you have to front end everything. So whatever nutrition you want to provide, should be provided upfront. You can't, you're not going to go back and um, add fertilizer because as I told you, bacterial activity will come to a standstill beyond at temperatures beyond 60, below 60. And uh, soil inside will still be warm, but um, there is not prolific bacterial activity. So adding nitrogen, adding potassium, adding top ups, all of that is not part of winter gardening at all. All that you do in summer, you must remember that Activity is not so much in the leaves as it is in the roots. So you're not really nitrogenizing the soil to achieve growth. So add a layer of compost before you transplant and before you prepare your beds with the compost and soil and uh, uh, get them ready. Once the beds are there, just put your seeds in. Those are what you see there is one row of carrots and then there is spinach. And there is chuka, there is a, a, there is a sorrel, and then there is napa cabbage, and then there is cilantro. So just draw lines. Yeah. Once you put in, draw lines, put the seeds in, poke with the tip of your fingers. That's what we do, right? Put a row of seeds, draw a line, put a sprinkle seeds, use these fingers to just poke, 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 water, and done. They all will come. Yeah. So there's really nothing. Just buy those seeds. I have seen several people who call me to help with their gardens. They have a basket in which they have packets. So they are hoping that someday they will put it, but they're so scared of failure that these packets are just stored, right? Bring all those packets out and please sow all those seeds. They're meant to be sown in the ground. Just sow away. Keep sowing now until 31st of October. Sow away. In four to five days, your plants will germinate, yeah? 
and uh, these all were sown um, on the 16th of September. So all of this is just a month old. So they all have come up and they're uh, already looking beautiful. Those That's are carrots, right, Uma, in the first row? That is called onions. No, That's first carrot. That first row is carrot and then there's onion and then there is um, uh, spinach and then there is um, carrots again and then there is radish. So try and have, as I said, try and have as much diversity as, as possible. Um, so uh, I'm late for carrots, but I, I still want to try. This one is an early 60 day variety. So I'm hoping that the carrots will be found before Persicon hits. It was sown around September, mid-September. So by mid-November, they should be ready. Uh, you can plant transplants. Um, these are uh, uh, transplants which my friends um, uh, gave me as uh, farewell gifts. I just moved homes. So my bucket friends gave me a, a, a basket of, I usually grow everything from seeds. I don't uh, buy transplants from store. But um, this bed has, what you see in the middle are, uh, these are all the fava beans that uh, came from seeds. These are all turnips that are volunteers that have just come in. These are cabbage seedlings grown from seeds. That's lettuce. Now these are all, these tall ones are all transplants from stores which were given as gifts by friends. Uh, they've all grown. Uh, plants take root and grow fairly quickly in this time. It's ideal temperatures for them because they're not fighting the heat of the sun. Um, it is not too hot for the plant to be stressed, but it's not so cold that they cannot grow. So all the winter plants will set roots and grow very happily at this time. If there's an ideal time to put seeds in the ground, it's now. The, so the time from September 15th to October end, October 15th, I would say, I would stretch it to October end. <laughs> That's the ideal time to put seeds in because temperatures are absolutely perfect. They are between 60 and 80 and most of the plants will love it. That's really the crux of winter and fall gardening. You are capturing the ideal time when seeds will germinate and get the plant started. Once the plants are started, then they will survive through winter and they'll start yielding through the winter and through the spring. So many who go to, I only feel sorry for many who will go and buy cabbages and cauliflowers in April. It's so hot. The insects will get them. You should plant them. You should overwinter them. Plant them in October and start harvesting them from March onwards. You will have absolutely pest-free cabbages, cauliflowers, broccoli, and everything else that you want to have. Yeah. So that's the way to do it. Um, I will get to the last section on maintenance. Okay. Just one question more before that. So which yeah. means when you talked about the beds getting, and I saw your beds, the all sown beautifully. That means all your summer crop plants that might have still been yielding, they've all come down, is it? I mean, I know in your case, you moved house, but uh, yes. typically for most of our yes. in houses. Yes. You don't have to harvest the last tomato of that uh, poor plant that has been yielding since May. Give it a break. Right. It's not, I mean, if you waited, see, as I said earlier, I mean, this is a very common mistake. Uh, even some of my very dear friends have done. So you don't have the heart to bring down the chilies. I don't have the heart to bring down the brinjols. So you keep waiting and then you wait till end of October and then you put the seeds. It's so cold. The seeds don't germinate. Frost hits by mid-November. The plants are still tiny. They're so weak. They die. Then you have no winter garden. So if you're not sowing by end of September, early October, mid-October, and not giving your plants about four to six weeks to establish before frost hits. Right. Mm -hmm. Very unlikely you will have no winter garden. So if you are fantasizing about a winter garden, your seeds must be in the ground already or they should be in the ground now. So you must bring them down. So to kind of answer that question, please mm -hmm. bring your summer crop down. Please tell yourself that you have eaten enough. And give your family some respite from the bottle goats and the purple chikadukais and the, um, um, you know, what uh, and the bindis that you have been feeding them relentlessly. Give them a break and bring those plants down. Yeah, there's one more question from somebody else as well um, about tilling the soil. Do we need to till the soil at all no. before we put the compost in? No. And pull out I the, the soil um, at all. I don't till the soil at all. I mean, it's of course your matter of preference. 
each one has a certain style of gardening. Uh, in my case, because I am, I subscribe to the science that there is a fungal network which is created in the soil, which works uh, along with the plants. And any digging disturbs that network. I and earthworms go in and create tunnels through which roots have established. So once I have set up a bed, I don't till the soil, turn the soil at all. Uh, that means I get no weeds. Because I don't turn the soil, I have no weeds. Um, so I will put in a layer of compost and I will put in a layer of mulch and I will keep topping that up twice a year, every year. So right. April is compost, May is mulch. October is compost, November is mulch. That's it. Year after year after year. That's what I do. Right. Uh, up to you. If tilling makes you happy, please go ahead and do it. There is nothing like you can't till. Okay? You don't have to. I know I followed what you've done, taught me in terms of so even snipping the plants. And um, um, garden, gardening need not be so much of hard work. You can just put up the beds, fill it up with soil and put your seeds and be done. That's what it's, I have done there. I have layered cardboard that I got from moving on the lawn. I've just layered, layered them with cardboard, topped it up with wood chips, put my raised beds, filled it up with soil. That garden that you see, I removed four weeks ago. So the garden that you see is was set up, uh, was sown about three weeks ago. So, and uh, I haven't dug anything at all. I haven't dug any holes. And um, uh, so it, 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 it's a matter of preference. I would put it like that. Some people like the idea of tilling. tilling. And, uh, yeah. 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 Now, many of my women friends tell me, I want to set up my garden, but my husband is not willing to do the work. <laughs> Nothing for the husband to do, okay? In our uh, house, I, you get absolutely beautiful um, upper body strength uh, working on the uh, mulch and the garden. And there's nothing there which is so hard to do, yeah? Put those frames in and fill up soil and you're, you're done. Okay, um, now to maintenance. This is the most important part of the winter garden. You have uh, cleared up the garden, you have put up the soil, you put the compost uh, and you have put your seeds and your plants are coming up. The only way these plants will be protected from the harsh winter is by the mulch. So all the fall leaves, this fall, please do not allow a single leaf to leave your yard. Please get the leaves collected. Use the lawn mower to crush them, pile them up in the same bags in which don't place them outside for um, the guys to clear and take it away. They're precious. The leaves hold nutrition that has been collected by the tree all through summer. There are valuable minerals. There is valuable carbon. The beautiful material that plants need in those leaves. Don't throw them away. Crush them. Return them to the soil. You can see how I've mulched there. Completely mulch three to four inches of leaf mulch on all your beds by Thanksgiving day in Atlanta. Rest of the places before your frost hits. That is how your soil will be protected and the life in your soil will be protected and uh, the plants will not be hurt by the winter rains. A combination of winter rain, moisture and cold will kill most plants. So if you just put these plants and let them be there, you're unlikely to have any surviving plants. Without mulch, your winter garden will die. So you must mulch thoroughly. The fleece cloth which you see there is optional. I have put in the fleece cloth because I was traveling. I was not going to be there. So I was not sure how many days of frost. Now, if you have continuous days of frost, as I was saying, if you had one or two cold nights intermittently, the plants will be fine. But let's assume that you have a week of uh, sub-zero temperatures, sub-30 temperatures. Plants will be affected. They will need a cover. Right? Now, the fleece cloth is available as a roll. Long roll of uh, over um, uh, 500 meters is about $30. Okay? So you can buy it. You can share uh, this material, you know, and you, those PVC pipes are from Home Depot. I think each one is about two dollars or something. So these are thin PVC pipes. You get them and you get you cut them up, and then you just uh, bend them out into a semicircle, tuck them into the ground, 
okay and then put the fleece cloth on the top you can see the last bed i've just spread it out and put some stones okay so this it doesn't have to be an elaborate setup but as you know in america every system has tremendous amount of customer support uh, beautiful design of various products there is fleece clip there is fleece holder there is fleece uh, frame uh, there is fleece edge there is fleece pin so if you want to buy a whole set of paraphernalia for fleece covering your garden it's available in the store but if you don't want to do anything the only critical component there is that cloth okay that cloth will let light through but it will it will let moisture through it will let light through but it will protect uh, it will create an environment of uh, lower uh, higher temperatures below it will not it will stop the plant from uh, freezing or dying from extreme cold so some of you are not from uh, zone 7 but a lower might require these because the number of days your garden will be uh, uh, below freezing temperatures might be higher in atlanta it is only about um, a dozen or 14 days in an entire season atlanta doesn't really have uh, sub 30 temperatures for more than those number of days this amount of protection is is adequate it is not a must but if you do this your the 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 you will find that the growth of your plants particularly the greens the tender greens tend to enjoy uh this kind of cover during winter because the temperatures are ideal and uh, it's nice and bright and white inside and um, uh, you could do it um it's not as i said you know if uh, you uh, the forecast for this year's winter is mild that's what the forecast says now but we know how forecasts are they can change so use your discretion to use fleece cloth in your uh, garden it's not mandatory but it might protect you if there is a persistent uh low temperature in the garden you don't have to have an entire setup you can just spread the cloth on the garden bed and simply put bricks on all the sides yeah and the mulch that you use is typically just the leaves is it the brown yeah. on the bed you use leaves where your plants are you use leaves outside the bed where you're walking you can use wood chips right and okay. uh, one more question it's, you know someone's asked is about uh, chantana uh some of plants that as we cut them down and when you see you know we're clearing the bed you see fallen fruits there you know tomato that's fallen do we leave it all in the bed or yeah, do we have to clear fine, the bed we we'll find some nice volunteers coming up next year that's good it's fine you can just leave them on the bed then yeah yeah absolutely tomatoes okay. and have just passed their prime absolutely chandana just don't worry at all enough tomatoes have been eaten let's just clip them off and uh, compost them yeah compost them and by april they will all form beautiful compost okay bring those uh, summer plants in you can also do another thing you can take off the leaves at the bottom leave only the stick standing plant around the plant put the transplants around the plant okay if you want to harvest the last brinjal right and uh, as these winter plants grow clip off the uh, uh, egg plant yeah you could do that too you can try that also but go out and put those seeds right don't uh, uh, wait till the last brinjal has come last egg plant has been harvested and then by end november i have so many friends who call me uh, by mid november and say what can i sow now i'm saying nothing you have to wait till february it's gone your overwintering window is gone right yeah so and what can you sow after all in february you can only sow peas and radish and carrots everything else requires overwintering you can't sow cabbage and broccoli and all of that that's gone yeah so if you want a big range of winter crops please sow now now you can see here i have just covered it with fleece cloth and i have just used sticks you see those stakes there i have just left the stakes to cover them that's it that's more than enough because the plants are anyway very tiny right in december it's only after the persipon is over that they're going to break out and uh, grow big so this is fine yeah please use fleece cover if temperatures fall below a uh, freezing or fall below 25 for a long period of time as i said earlier this is like a, a completely frozen cabbage some plants will just take the cold on their chin your spinaches your cilantro cabbages broccoli cauliflower brussels sprouts love the cold oh the you won't believe the taste of the brussels sprouts soon after a frost they are absolutely crunchy and beautiful and they roast very well you know so don't try eating brussels sprouts in the middle of summer you know it's a winter crop eat it in january when it produces fresh and you will become a fan uh so some plants all of those can take the winter on the argilla will take it lettuce will take it 
some plants like peas, uh, some plants like um, uh, the uh, uh, winter uh, plants, beetroots and all can take, beetroots will take the cold, uh, carrots will take the cold. Only some of the greens, you know, some of some certain types of lettuce, certain types of spinach, certain types of salad greens, you will find that they will uh, somewhat shrivel up if there is cold. Typically, if there is cold and rain, some of these plants can rot. Uh, some of the leafy plants can rot. They can't take that combination of cold and wet. Uh, so they, they do tend to get stressed. So you can clip off uh, if you find anything rotting. Um, Otherwise, left alone, they will all be doing fine. Yeah, uh, putting a cover uh, helps many of them. Now, well, just one more question, Uma. Just sorry, yeah. since we are going on Zoom and it's you know people from not just from Atlanta, someone was asked about: Is there any specific vegetables that we can grow in colder regions where the temperature falls to negative twenty degrees Celsius? Okay, if you have. Uh, if you have a temperature of negative 20 degrees, you will need a winter setup, which means that you will have a you will need a hoop house. You will need to set up a hoop house with complete protection and maintain the inside temperatures uh, much higher. There are no plants that will take minus 20. Plants won't grow at the temperature. Right. So you will have to create a hoop house facility, which will a greenhouse, a hoop house, or a complete fleece uh, covered garden setup to be able to grow vegetables at that. You, you need what we call as cold frame gardening. You need to have uh, covers. Now, um, uh, if you're able to build those covers now, you know, if you're able to build a frame, cover it up completely with fleece, tuck it up well on both the sides and put your plants in now, put your seeds and plants in now and have a way to kind of seal it up uh, before the frost hits you know, the plants will survive inside. Uh, the temperatures inside will have to be maintained at a, a level which is much higher, about uh, 50s and 60s is the kind of temperature you want inside. Uh, without that, the plants will not grow. Um, yeah. Two specific vegetables, celery and mustard greens. Yeah. Is it good to put them in now or uh, in spring? No, 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 no. No. You, don't put them in, uh, if you put mustard in spring, you will get them, but you won't get the kind of uh, crunch you get from a mustard that's put now. Celery, definitely now. Celery, definitely now, okay. Yeah, leaves, celery, 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 onion, garlic, all now, yeah. Turnip, rhubarb, all of them now, okay. Is now, there any guidance, yeah. sorry, sorry, one more, just in case you're touching on it later, let me, you just continue. But winter companion plants, is there anything like that that we have to watch for? You don't actually need it, but in the garden as a rule, you will put in herbs and plants together always. It's you know, herbs will have those, you know, put in cilantro, put in dill, put in, and try to have, for example, you know, your, your most beautiful winter companions are onions and garlic. Don't make an onion bed or a garlic bed. Mm -hmm. Just put your garlic plants all over the garden. Okay. The only plants that don't like onion and garlic are beans. Ooh. Beans and beans doesn't grow very well uh, near uh, onion or garlic. I mean, but these are not things. I mean, I have grown beans in in the garlic bed itself because <laughs> I uh, uh, I forgot this rule. You know, the plant did not do very well, but it still yielded some beans. It's it, it, it not end of the world. Okay, but uh, so don't worry too much about remembering, having to memorize and remember companion uh, gardening. But okay. remember that you will you will think of the adult height of the plant. Okay, the way you will put the plant is one plant should not shade the other. One plant provides enough space for the other to grow. A, a large number of winter vegetables, as you can see here, the spinach I have sown. Spinach mm -hmm. loves to grow together in a bunch. Now that space that you have between the spinach and the sorrel, I will be sowing um, another uh, row of cabbages there in uh, a couple of days. Yeah, you see that uh, Napa cabbage that is there. So try and have herbs, um, fragrant plants all around the garden. You should do well. Perfect. And all of these, you know, things like radish and all of them are, we know, are fragrant plants. So they are all, they're all, they all control pests. 
Now, you must remember that these are the don'ts for winter gardening. Don't water, okay? Because the water will be at a temperature which is different from the temperature of the soil drastically. Remember that the soil in winter will be absolutely cold. So your soil will be at about 35 and your water will be at about 60. That will shock the roots. So don't water. Don't water, don't dig, don't fertilize, don't prune. Don't hurt the plants. Plants will find it very difficult to heal in winter because the temperatures are very cold. So don't cut, trim, prune, expose the plant, don't dig. Don't put spade to soil after uh, persipon particularly. Don't water, don't fertilize. Front end, put all your seeds, put all your transplants, work very hard over the next two to three weeks. Set them all up and relax and just take the harvests. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so those are the don'ts. That is the end of the presentation. <laughs> I, I don't want to keep this slide, which is like all full of don'ts and don'ts and don'ts. <laughs> Any kind of uh, keep this, which is like a, the, the, the cabbage taking the cold on its chin. Yeah. So winter gardening is absolute fun because you don't have to do the hard work. You don't have to be out there, um, you know, looking after the plants. You can layer up to go and harvest, but um, there is a, all right, probably we'll go to the list. This is probably a good place to be. Yeah. So there is a whole range of beautiful things to grow over the next uh, few months. Uh, so if you find your friend uh, showing off her cauliflower um, harvest, please remember that she sowed them in October and got the cauliflower in May. Ah, okay. okay. That's okay. Because your garden is filled with stuff. There is all, are there other things to harvest, right? So winter garden is also about patience. You put something in now, it all looks tiny and innocuous now. And then it takes off and forms beautiful heads. Cauliflowers will form such beautiful, creamy, white heads in uh, April. And it is such a joy to harvest them. And to assume that, you know, sowing them somehow into spindly seedlings in March indoors and then transplanting them in early April will somehow give them is all um, uh, uh, too foolhardy. Okay, don't attempt that. Put them, be smart and put them right now. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, so think... gardening is really very easy. Um, put in a lot of greens. Um, and keep sowing and enjoy yourself and allow nature to produce the sugars for you and make them available to you. The most important thing about winter gardening is if you kept a winter garden and kept your garden alive, I promise you, you will have no pest to deal with in summer. You will have no pest to deal with. Added benefit for getting us into winter gardening. Because the nematodes and the earth activity, they would have eaten up all the pest eggs that are trying to overwinter. So your soil will be absolutely beautiful unless you bring some more, you know, pest egg filled plastic bags from the garden and put them in spring. Many people will top up their soil, you know, they will bring all the plastic bag filled soil and uh, cover it up in spring and uh, return the pest eggs to the soil. I can't help you there. But if you did not do that, and you just relied on your good old compost and leaf mulch and had an active winter garden, trust me, you will have no pests in summer. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to spray anything in, people. should I spray Bt? Should I spray, uh, you know, neem uh, oil? Should I spray garlic? You don't have to spray anything. That, actually, this comment of yours answered several of the questions which I was just one, you know, reference right now because there were people asking about what should we spray and what you know what can we use for organic you fertilizer. Don't spray anything. Your garden requires no spray of anything. Don't do anything. Not in winter. Not in summer. Don't spray. <laughs> it just requires the soil to be taken care of and fed. Mulch your soil well, and everything is going to be fine. There's no need to spray anything at all. Thanks so much. This has really been a very, very interesting and uh, session with lots of things for us to learn and start doing immediately.
I think if we can yeah. make this play, yeah, just the timing, Gita. I think um, you know if we um, we are already like mid October, so uh, we will run out of time very quickly. So please go ahead. And definitely. I mean, I think. I mean, I know this time we organized this this particular webinar right smack where you're supposed to be doing the activity or halfway done, but uh, we still have a let's say a yeah, week. So no, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we make sure that we, we make sure everyone's and, uh, in the forecast is that October is going to be warmer than usual. We're expecting October to be two to four, three degrees warmer than usual. So there is a God sent window available uh, to sow some seeds and put in some transplants. The and green cells had a call there with God on that. Stores and uh, retrieve those little boxes of cabbages and cauliflowers waiting to be done, to be put into the ground. Yeah, the green cell actually I told God about that. You know, we are organizing the webinar now, so please make sure we have the window. <laughs> he must have heard you. All right. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined us. Yeah, so, sorry, Gita. Any of you having any questions? Any, yes. Please uh, write to the somebody asked cell. it. Yeah, please uh, write to Green Cell. Please get in touch with Green Cell if you are having a problem setting up your garden, you have questions and you need help with composting, you need help with uh, growing a garden. We're more than happy to come and uh, help you create a self-sustaining garden. Yeah, please get in touch with us. Thank you. One, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, this is a note for everybody who joined us on the call. We have tried to get to most of the questions and you know get the answers for most of the questions. I know that some haven't been answered, but um, you know we're available at Green Cell. Um, we have a Facebook page. Mark, can you just show the last slide for the next webinar as well? If you don't mind. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Sorry, Gita. No, no, no problem. Sorry. So we have uh, you know if you have any questions that have not been answered. Send us a message on our to our Gmail or to on our Facebook uh, page, and we will definitely uh, get you get your questions answered. At this point, we have recorded all your questions, so we will make sure that we reach out to you all with the answers if it's not been answered already. And uh, thank you again, Uma, for this wonderful session. And uh, this is our webinar, and uh, this is the. Um, these are the contact details. Yeah, these are the contact information that we have, where you can either our know, phone number, green cell, atl at gmail.com. If you drop us an email with your questions, we will get back with you with the answers. And if you need any help, like Uma said, she is always available and willing to help out anyone. I mean, like I told you, she handholds us right through the process. Um, and there is a survey link that we have sent you on the chat message here. On the window, please do reply. This will help us in organizing webinars that will be of interest to y'all. Any topics that y'all have uh, that y'all want to hear about, that y'all want us to speak to, we can help organize it. That will uh, help us all live in a more sustainable way. That's the entire objective of Green Cell. Um, so this is another slide I'd like y'all to take a picture of so that y'all can see it and then have the information. And uh, Uma, you want to go back to the November webinar? Yeah. We have the next webinar planned for November, November 15th. And that's going to be on hydroponics farming. That's indoor farming for those of us who want to try something different, uh, which is, I know, I mean, um, very convenient for a lot of people who can't really, either don't have access to the soil, don't have access to a yard, or for other reasons, health reasons, are not able to go and do the actual yard work. This is another methodology in which you can employ to grow your uh, vegetables. So we have uh, Russell George joining us and he will explain to us how, you know, how to set up a hydroponics set up at your home and grow your own vegetables and fruits and uh, vegetables. So uh, mark your calendars, uh, hoping to have all of you join us again in November. Thank you all from Green Cell again and um, reach out to us anytime you want. And if you want to join us, to volunteer with us. We are re waiting for you there. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll close in a couple of minutes. Yes, I think That's we can open the chat window. That's it. Yeah, keep the chat window open so that we can capture the questions. Uh, that would be great. We have copied all the questions and we will have a backup of the chat.
Okay, excellent. I'm ending the live stream right now. Zoom will be still open. Perfect. Hello, this is uh, Mani here. I've got a quick question. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I just uh, I posted a question before about the uh, replenishing soil in containers. So I, I think definitely I understood that uh, actually planting something in the winter would help the soil. Um, in addition to that, anything else to be done uh, for next season uh, to plant uh, regular vegetables during summertime? Is that also in containers? Uh, yeah. So even um, yeah, I I have. Yeah. I have some in you know I have some containers, but I also have a bed and a few beds. Yeah. But uh, there are a lot of containers as well. I just I was wondering how to replenish the soil there. Yeah, Uma, just one minute. Just the location I wanted to find out. So are you also located uh, in Atlanta? Atlanta, yeah, it, I'm 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 in Atlanta. Help, Uma. Uh, so Uma, uh, hi, hey, this is Rashmi. Just to add on that, uh, I do have grow bags. I really don't have a vegetable bed. Uh, I usually uh, have grow bags and uh, containers, so I'm not sure if I can continue okay, for the fine. winter gardening in those. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. I will just have two points there as far as the container garden goes, which I hope will answer both your questions, Mani and Rashmita. Um, adding of organic matter doesn't change. So adding a layer of compost on the top, a two to three, two inch layer of compost and adding a four inch layer of crushed leaves, three or four inch layer of crushed leaves as mulch doesn't change whether it is on the ground or it is for the container, okay? So when you add this, this is a layer of fresh organic matter that you're adding, which will enrich your entire container because what will happen is the earthworms that are there inside will come in and keep taking these, the compost and mulch right down. You know, they'll be living at the bottom of your container. They'll keep taking this food down and distributing it all through your container. So adding organic matter regularly at least twice a year add compost add crushed leaves in uh, the fall and repeat it again in the spring that will keep your container soil absolutely fluffy fresh and replenished okay you don't have to uh, remove the soil and add soil you don't have to do anything like that you just need to top up that's the first thing as far as container garden goes i think that answers money's question as far as your question rashmita is concerned now Containers, there's only, there are two problems in container growing. The first one is that there's a limited amount of material for the plant to uh, uh, depend on. So you must make sure that that material is uh, rich and good, right? So which is why we add compost, we add uh, uh, mulch to it. You might have to add a top-up uh, compost or vermicompost. You might have to add another dose depending on how healthy your plant looks. So top-up fertilizers may be required because sometimes what will happen is when the container is in rain, too much of rain can leach out much of the nutrition that is in the soil in the container. So the container soil can get depleted when it is um, exposed to too much of rain. So it might require a top-up. That's the first thing you must remember. Look at your plant, look at the leaves, look at its growth and to make that uh, call. The second thing that you must remember is that wind, because of the limited amount of medium, the medium can become dry. Particularly if your container is porous, like if your container is that black cloth material, the air pruning bag, you know, it has, or even otherwise, the container is little soil and therefore it will dry out faster. So it is good to remember that you have to water more frequently and water deeply. So when I spoke about not watering the soil in the ground okay if you're doing winter gardening in the container you will you might perforce have to water the plants that can affect their growth because the soil will be cold you will be adding warm water so the soil will get shot from time to time when you add uh, water so winter gardening in containers tends to um, uh, suffer from the shocks, the ease are not great, but leafy vegetables will do perfectly fine. It's only with respect to, you know, fruiting vegetables like your cabbages, cauliflowers, broccoli. You know, the container yield is relatively 
smaller than uh, the ground. You don't get huge cabbages in containers unless you place these containers in a greenhouse or something and uh, in temperature controlled uh, environments. So that's the limitation. Sorry, long answer to a short question, but I hope it answered that question. I think that was good. I mean, I think it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's very informative. Yeah. Thank you, Amal. All right. It was an awesome session. Really good. I, 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 very informative. I learned a lot uh, from the session. Thank, Thank, Thank you, you really uh, very much, Uma. Appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. Closing the session now. Thank you, Uma. Thank you, Gita. All right. I can leave uh, Gita. Yes, you can leave now, Uma. I mean, yeah. All right. Thanks Thank a lot. You. It was a great session again. I think it was. Thank uh, you. I just, uh, just, very well attended. Say, I just wanted to see what the questions and feedback was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I we'll send, uh, send you. Send you a good, you know, um, uh, document. Public. Sorry. Go ahead. Was the audio all right? Yes, audio was good. It was uh, it, it was perfect. Audio lighting, everything was good. No, uh, 